Good morning, everybody, and welcome back. I hope you all uh, really enjoyed the breakout session. Uh, my name is Jennifer Lotito. I am the president and COO at RED, and I'm thrilled to be your session leader for this session six about transforming perceptions. I'm going to ask that we start by having you all envision the, the steepest hill you've ever climbed, or maybe if you're like me, snowboarded, but just think about what it looks like when you're approaching that mountain. If you grew up in a family of really adventurous uh, siblings or parents, or perhaps you love getting out there and doing a big trek or taking on a huge mountain, you might look at that hill and say, I got this, and you just head on up. Or you could look at that hill and think that you're seeing Mount Everest and you want to head to the lodge for a cocktail, which is something that I would probably want to do. But as UVA psychologist Dennis Prophet would say, that is all about perception. So for the past 18 years at Red, the company that I lead, we've been responsible and at the epicenter of transforming perceptions of global health. So let's just go back to the early 2000s. The world was, on, was in a five alarm fire with an AIDS crisis. We had 30 million people on the continent of Africa living with HIV. 30 million people. Numbers are sometimes hard to grasp. That's pretty much the uh, population of Texas, a little bit smaller than Canada and California. All of those people living with a preventable and treatable disease, 30 million. 50,000 had treatment. 50,000, which meant 5,000 people every single day were dying of a preventable and treatable disease. The world's attention was elsewhere. They weren't focused on it. You know, they, they, the, the, the perception, you know, in many parts of the world is, it was, the AIDS crisis is over. A perception that still lives to this day, unfortunately, uh, and it's not. Um, so, you know, all of these people are trying, not, not focused on this. There's other issues that are, that are taking people's attention. And they also don't know what to do. They don't know how to engage. They think, well, that's them over there and I'm over here. So we needed to change perception. We needed to change the perception that the world's biggest killer wasn't a disease, but was actually injustice and discrimination because people in Africa were dying of a disease that if you were diagnosed here in Chicago, you would walk to your local Walgreens and get treatment. So that was really why RED was created. RED was created to create heat, getting people to care, and generating money to get the treatment where it was needed. So how are we going to do that? You know, our co-founder Bono and Bobby Shriver had this crazy idea of saying, well, what if we got the world's biggest brands to create products, and when you bought back then an iPod, Gap t-shirt, pair of Converse sneakers, a piece of that would go to help fund the drugs that were needed, those drugs that you could pick up at a Walgreens or a CVS here in the States, but were unaffordable on the continent of Africa. So there's an idea there, very simple idea that Bono and Bobby had, but they needed to fund it. How do we get started? Simple idea, but we needed money to do it. So, as, a as any good story goes, two guys walk into a bar. Those guys happen to be Bono and, Bobby and, Bono and Bill Gates. Um, Bono sells a bill on the idea, simple idea. And not only did we want to get those companies, their products out there, we wanted their marketing budgets. We wanted their creative people, the creative minds working on behalf of the world's poorest. So thankfully, Bono, was, he's a very good salesman. He sold that idea to Bill, and Bill signed up to help us. And I would argue there are three reasons why the Gates Foundation agreed to fund us. The first is, is that they understand the nexus of global health and business. Somebody said it earlier. You cannot have thriving economies without healthy communities. You know, you can't, Africa is never going to get lifted, is never going to lift itself out of poverty if we can't get them healthy, and that was the focus. If we can get people healthy, the communities are healthy, and the economies begin to thrive. Bill understood that and still does. There was also this idea of scale. Governments had been involved. Governments can scale. 
Governments can write huge checks. What governments don't do really well is take risks. They can't, they, they, they can't take risks. They don't have as much of an ability to understand an objective and a strategy, and maybe if it doesn't work, change it, learn from it, and try something else. So there was a, that was number two. Number three was uh, the need for storytelling. When you think about transforming perceptions, how do you do that? You tell a great story. So for all three of those reasons, I would argue, the Gates Foundation decided to fund us on this very simple idea. So we started with storytelling. We started with stories like the Lazarus Effect, helping people understand that if you are HIV positive and you get on treatment two pills a day, you are returned from death's door to being a thriving member of the community and the economy in a, sp in a span of about 90 days. Uh, we also did a campaign that talked about how cheap it is to get those meds. At the time, it was 40 cents, called a 40 cents campaign, that told you know, how trivial 40 cents is, but it was the difference between life and death. So those were the stories that we started to tell, and we had to get companies on board, companies like Apple, companies like Gap, companies now like Starbucks, Salesforce, Bank of America, and even more recently, life science companies. Nobody knows this fight better than those of you in this room who work in the life science field. You guys are on the front lines. This was a group that we had never talked to before, but we realized the huge opportunity that we have to not just go out and talk about sneakers and iPods, but actually talk about the life science companies that are helping deliver it. So there's work, more work to do. We've generated over $750 million so far. We have um, impacted over 245 million lives, which is great, because we're only about 23 people in New York. Um, but, like I said, there's more work to do, but it's also really important to not just look at the numbers. What's really important is to talk about the human stories and the impact. And for those of you who have followed the Red Journey for a while, you've probably seen us and heard us talking about Connie Mudenda, a friend of ours, a friend of mine. Connie went through unimaginable tragedy back in the early 2000s when she lost not one, not two, but all three of her children to the HIV and AIDS virus. She figured she was next. She just assumed that this virus that took her children was going to take her next. But instead, in her community, a new program came in that provided ARVs for free. Connie got on treatment. Connie then got healthy, became a peer educator to other people, and went on to have an HIV negative baby, Labona. Connie has continued to work with RED. She has, uh, a few years back, we had a replenishment conference in New York, and there was Connie standing amongst President Joe Biden, the host of the conference, President Trudeau, President Macron, and there's Connie being able to tell the story for all to see. But the best part was Labona, that was, who was also there, who stole Joe Biden's heart, who, ne who, who I would say President Biden understood, politics aside, that if you invest in getting people healthy, the impact long term is invaluable. So there's more work to do. I want to ask everybody in this room, you guys are all about impact. We want, to be, we want to continue to partner with the world's biggest companies. We want to continue to partner with visionary leaders, those in philanthropy, those in foundations. You guys talked yesterday about impact. What incredible stories that you had. We want to work with all of you. I would love to talk to you. My email is jennifer at red.org, really easy. Um, but you know, we need to make sure and work together with everybody because you know, 43 years ago today, actually, I must say, the CDC, 43 years ago, some of you were probably not even born yet, the CDC put out their first paper on the AIDS virus. So we are now in 2024. What's going to happen with this virus? It's going to go into the dustbin of history, but who is going to be there to help write that story with us? I ask all of you to join us. In September, we'll be making a very big pledge, a very big statement, um, and we would love to have some visionary leaders join us for that. So I want to thank you all for your attention, and I'm going to turn it over now to Dale, who's going to join me up on stage. Dale Strange, who is the president and COO of Corporate Impact and Solutions at Blackboard, for a talk on breaking boundaries, three keys to, access, to accelerate social change. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much.